from the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Fifteen years ago, Turkey was the great democratic beacon of the Islamic world. Back then, Turkey's current president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, was viewed as a moderate Islamist. Once a political prisoner, Erdogan had been mayor of Istanbul and was viewed as a modernizing technocrat when he became prime minister back in 2003. How times have changed. In recent years, Erdogan's Turkey has become more authoritarian. A failed military coup against him last year led to a massive purge. Dozens of independent media outlets and publishers were closed. More than 47,000 people have been arrested. An estimated 100,000 teachers, civil servants, and other government officials have been fired. Now, in April, Erdogan narrowly won a constitutional referendum, granting him sweeping new powers. That includes a change to term limits that would let him stay in power until 2029 and a reduced role for the country's legislature. Now, on this edition of Global Journalist, a look at whether democracy is dying in Turkey. Now, in a moment, we'll hear from a panel of experts, but first we're going to bring in Diego Cupolo. He's a freelance journalist and photographer based in the capital, Ankara, who has written for outlets including The Atlantic, Deutsche Welle, and Quartz. He joins us today from the city of Catania in Italy. Diego, welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, remind us, if you would, about the referendum that took place in April. What sorts of changes did it make to how Turkey is governed? Well, basically, it was a referendum to strengthen the the mandate of President Tayyip Erdogan, giving him uh, concentrated powers, basically, to compare it to the United States. You have different branches of governments. You have Supreme Court. And in the Turkish referendum, Turkish voters voted by a slim majority to grant President Erdogan uh, complete control over the Supreme Court and who gets assigned to it, also extending his term limits, and at the same time, um, basically, right now we're running a, the country's running on a state of emergency, which means that he can rule by decree law, and this referendum pretty much extends that decree law where, similar to Trump's executive orders, anything that uh, President Erdogan signs he basically becomes law uh, with little checks and balances, a uh, little uh, opposition. And this is part of the what's probably causing concern outside of Turkey from uh, international observers. Sure. And the significant difference with the executive orders, at least with respect to the travel ban signed by President Trump, is that they have been stayed in court pending, pending legal review. But I want to ask you about this referendum, which passed with just 51 percent of the vote. To outsiders, this looks like a rollback of democracy in Turkey. Why? What, what explains why such a significant portion of the Turkish electorate supported this? Well, it was 51% that passed this referendum, and we should keep that in mind. There's 49% that voted no, and there were voting discrepancies, uh, largely reported reported by my colleagues like Nick Ashton, which you'll hear from soon. And what explains the motives behind it is a complex mix of uh, dynamics all coming together at the same time. Basically, if you have a business and you don't support the ruling government, uh, you have to keep in mind that there's also no opposition that's going to protect you if you vote no, and uh, there, there's no significant opposition that's going to uh, stand behind these, you know, dissident voters, let's say. Uh, and at this point, it doesn't, most people feel like they are personally endangering themselves by standing up against the government without a, a real strong opposition that can do anything significant at the moment. People will say, yes, there's opposition parties, but they, they've shown uh, very weak in recent years and uh, have had their powers undermined uh, with different uh, political scandals and, let's say, uh, concentration of power that we're seeing with Erdogan. Well, you, meant, you mentioned this issue of intimidation, and in the recent past, Turkey had a very lively and critical press, both in Turkish and English for the past decade, or even more. And we mentioned that a number of these news outlets have been closed since the coup attempt last July. What's the situation for the Turkish media now? Are, are things improving after this referendum, finally, or are they still on sort of a downward trajectory? Well, uh, 
the purges that we've seen since the coup attempt last year continue. We see people being jailed. Most recently, uh, the chair of Amnesty International working in Turkey just this week, Tanner Kilic, was jailed. Uh, and when you talk about free speech, there's been um, more than 150 news outlets that have been either censored or shut down or uh, in some way inhibited from doing uh, the journalism they were doing before. So media is definitely being silenced and you have editors of opposition newspapers like John Dundar having to go overseas uh, where they remain or where John Dundar remains at this moment and without any possibility of being able to come back. And you so, yourself, as I understand it, have had an altercation with the authorities, more, more than one altercation, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think all journalists at one point will have uh, some kind of meeting or run-in with police authorities. It, it is a country that has an active war zone in the southeast. Uh, there is state of emergency, which means that anybody is a suspect and... If you have a big camera or you're talking to suspicious people, you're going to have to answer some questions. Uh, and that's just how we live there. Well, you mentioned the war zone in the southeast of Turkey. Tell us just uh, a bit about sort of the current status of the conflict between Turkey and Kurdish groups right now. And obviously, I think the war in Syria has played a role in this. There's a lot of complex layers behind what we're talking about here. But inside Turkey, in the southeast, where a uh, Kurdish majority of the population ha uh, is based, there has been ongoing uh, round-the-clock curfews. There was active um, military operations in 2015, early 2016, which, you, which resulted in certain cities being completely leveled as uh, fighting took place inside high-dense residential areas. You could blame both sides. I mean, uh, the Kurdish militants brought the war zone into residential areas. At the same time, the curfews and military operations could be very uh, oppressive for some people. I mean, uh, imagine not being able to go outside and uh, having your city surrounded by armed vehicles and soldiers. Uh, sometimes they appear by uh, instantly with helicopters and just round up the town in order to catch a few militants and we have to understand that there is reason behind this and there are active groups trying to um, undermine the state and act against uh, President Erdogan but uh, what people in Amnesty International or human rights groups have been saying is that the reaction is often over uh, exaggerated in relation to the threat that's being posed by some of the militants. And you brought up Amnesty International. I understand that the head of Amnesty International in Turkey was recently arrested. Turkey has also arrested a number of other human rights figures and even humanitarian aid workers looking to aid refugees from Syria. Why is this going on? What's, what's the pattern here? Yeah, I reported on uh, certain groups, international NGOs like Mercy Corps based in the U.S. and certain other groups that have been uh, having troubles recently in Turkey because they do provide aid to northern Syria and considering that there's an active war going on between the Turkish state and the Kurdish militants which are spread out between southern Turkey and northern Syria, uh, any action that looks to be supporting Kurdish militants, whether it's delivering humanitarian aid, could be seen as uh, aiding the enemy from the Turkish state point of view. So in the end, you have certain humanitarian organization staff members being jailed in Turkey. Some have been deported. Uh, there was a D Danish NGO. They just had their Syrian staff, which was working as translators. They were jailed for several weeks and then uh, recently uh, deported to, to Sudan because obviously you can't deport Syrians back home. Uh, so the consequences have been dire for the humanitarian aid um, collective working in South Turkey, and it's definitely uh, stopping some aid from reaching northern Syria the way that it used to. Well, and, uh, Diego, we're, ju we're just about out of time, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. On today's show, we're talking about Turkey, a country once viewed as a democratic beacon in the Middle East and a potential member of the European Union. 
And critics say President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is killing the country's democracy, even as Turkey is mired in the war in Syria and faces ongoing conflict with Kurds within its borders. Now, to talk more about this, we're going to bring in three other guests who have been following Turkey closely. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Ikan Erdemir. He's a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy and until 2015 was an opposition member in Turkey's parliament. Joining us from Istanbul is Nick Ashdown. He's a freelance journalist who's written for The Atlantic, The Los Angeles Review of Books, and the website Al Monitor. And in LaGrange, Georgia, is John Torres. He's a political scientist who is researching Turkish politics at LaGrange College. Welcome to all of you. Nick Ashdown, you, you heard us talking with Diego Cupolo just a moment ago. The number of people purged from the government and from universities in Turkey is quite startling. Something like 100,000 people have lost their jobs. How, how does that play out on the ground in, in people's everyday lives? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, it's over 100,000 people uh, from the public sector that have been dismissed now. Um, that includes over 30,000 teachers, uh, 6,000 doctors, 5,000 academics. Uh, these tend to be, you know, sort of white class workers, professional, well-educated. Um, that's obviously a huge number. Uh, where they've been dismissed, um, they haven't they haven't been given usually specific charges. They haven't been presented with any kind of evidence. They're dismissed by uh, by presidential decree, and um, they have to actually find out that they've been dismissed by reading the the decree, reading these long lists of names. Um, their employers don't tell them. The government doesn't tell them. They have to actually either read in a newspaper or read um, in the official uh, the official newspaper that they've been dismissed. Um, these are largely middle class people, so this has created a huge uh, gap of of well educated people. And the thing is, they're not just dismissed; they're also blacklisted. So this means they can't ever get a job again in the public sector and it means it's very difficult for them to get jobs in the private sector. And what's the stated well. rationale so for these from President Erdogan, from the government? Well, the decrees, um, I think it contains a sentence that said it, it basically accuses people of being terrorists or related to a terrorist organization. Uh, I think the exact sentence is part of connected to or in communication with uh, a terrorist organization. Um, these purges that started immediately following the, the failed coup on July 15th, the, the first ones which started um, almost immediately, they were people who were directly, um, presumably directly involved in the coup, but it soon spread um, to two more stages. The second stage consisted of accused uh, so-called Gulenist followers of um, the, the Turkish Islamic preacher who is in self-imposed exile in, in Pennsylvania, Fethullah Gülen. Um, and that's, that's controversial because, I mean, what is a Gülenist? Um, they target people based on having a bank account with uh, Bank Asya, which is affiliated with the Gülen movement, but not all their, their customers are Gülenists. Uh, for having children in schools that are associated with the Gülen movement, uh, and rather arbitrary things like this. Um, and also, even if they are real uh, legitimate followers of the Gulen movement, that doesn't mean that they were involved in, in any way, shape, or form with the attempted coup. Um, and then the third wave, uh, which is still ongoing, uh, it targets basically anyone who uh, is critical of the government. This includes leftists, this includes um, journalists, academics, human rights workers, um, and basically anyone who criticizes the government. Well, let me let me turn this to Icon Erdemir in Washington, D.C., then, because many of President Erdogan's supporters say that they support him because he's a strong ruler, he's someone who asserts Turkey's rights and interests on the world stage. What do you make of that argument? Uh, now, in, in Turkey, there seems to be a conflation of the idea of a, a, a one-man rule or a strong-man rule uh, with uh, effective governance. Uh, at this point, the formula for Erdogan's supporters is that uh, Turkey needs one person who consolidates all power in his hands uh, to bring stability to Turkey. Uh, but we know that uh, the more Erdogan uh, single-handedly monopolizes power in Turkey, the more he underlines rule of law and due process, uh, 
the more he weakens institutions. And in fact, we're seeing that uh, Turkey is descending into further governance crisis, further you know, transparency crisis, further uh, crisis uh, in effective rule. And uh, I, I think this is a, an important lesson uh, Turkey uh, will learn yet again, because there were earlier coups. With each coup, we had similar lessons. Uh, apparently, we haven't learned the lesson well. And this time around, too, we will see that, uh, you know, purging tens of thousands of civil servants, uh, lifting, uh, you know, attorney-client privileges, uh, denying people the rule of law and uh, due process, is a sure way to destabilize a country, is a sure way to uh, undermine effective rule and security and stability in a country. And John Turas at Ledge Grange College, you've written about the U.S.-Turkish relationship. The two countries are NATO allies sworn to defend each other, but we have seen that relationship tested fairly significantly by the war in Syria, to the point that Turkish officials have even suggested that they might bomb U.S. commandos operating, operating in northern Syria. What, what's going on there? Uh, definitely, they want us to cut all support for the Syrian Kurds, who they see as linked to the PKK or the Kurdish uh, Workers' Party. Uh, Donald Trump has gotten a lot of pressure uh, to to drop support for the Syrian Kurds, and he has chosen not to do so so far. He's still backing the Syrian Kurds. Uh, Turkey has pretty much tried to intimidate us from doing so. Uh, even during the coup, you'll remember at the base at Insirilek, they were cutting all power to the base. Uh, they've had Turkish uh, ruling party politicians accuse the U.S. of Insirilek, backing. this is where the U.S. has a major air base in Turkey, correct? That, that is correct. That's where the Air Force base is, and that's something we need in the fight against ISIS. Well, Nick Ashdown, just to pick up on U.S. relations with Turkey, there has been seemingly more vocal anti-Americanism in Turkey over the past year or so. There have been images of anti-American marches with Turks burning U.S. flags. Erdogan's party accused the U.S. of being involved in the coup attempt last year. How, how strong is that feeling? Has it diminished over time? No, I think if anything, it's, it's increased over time. I mean, there's a long history in Turkey, despite the fact that um, it has it's, it's always been a very close partner and ally of the United States and NATO. Uh, there's a long history of anti-Americanism, but um, particularly since the failed coup, it's it's sort of gone into overdrive. It's, it's at one of its worst stages that it's ever been in. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, related to the coup, uh, there was a perception in Turkey that the United States was just sort of unsympathetic, uh, didn't show solidarity um, quickly enough or in, with enough force after the coup, which was a very, very devastating um, situation here. Uh, over two, uh, 270 people died, mostly civilians. Uh, it was a very bloody, very terrifying event. Um, and also... Uh, the perception here is that Fethullah Gulen and the, the Gulen movement was behind the coup, and of course Gulen is uh, living in the United States, so a lot of people don't understand why the United States wouldn't extradite Gulen to Turkey. And finally, of course, the situation in Syria. The United States uh, is in close partnership with the Syrian Kurds, uh, the YPG, which is uh, essentially the Syrian uh, affiliate of the PKK, which is a designated terrorist group, uh, which is involved in, in devastating attacks um, here in Turkey. So all those things combined uh, makes people very, very frustrated with the United States right now. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's show, we're talking about the future of Turkey, where President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has conducted a massive purge of suspected political opponents. We're joined by Ikon Erdemir of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, Nick Ashdown, an Istanbul-based freelance journalist, and John Turis, a political scientist who researches Turkey at LaGrange College in Georgia. If you're interested in more Global Journalist, you can visit our website, globaljournalist.org. There you can access our archives and find our ongoing reports on undercovered international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or subscribe to the program on YouTube. 
or iTunes. And Icon Erdemir, if I could turn this to you, Turkey is home to about 3 million refugees from Syria. And obviously, this is an issue that has played into Europe's uh, refugee crisis. It appears that President Erdogan has used the refugee issue sort of strategically to extract concessions from Europe and the U.S. How, how has that played out? Um, yes, uh, President Erdogan has two distinct rhetoric when it comes to the Syrian refugees. Uh, on the one hand, he sounds very benevolent, uh, very welcoming. Uh, he highlights Turkey's historical role uh, to host these refugees, which is something we all commend. Uh, but then at the same time, he instrumentalizes the refugees. He uh, threatens the European Union of busing the refugees to the EU borders. Uh, he, he knows that uh, the refugees are a trump card in his dealings uh, with the uh, European Union. He uses them to gain concessions, further concessions, uh, or uh, simply appeasement uh, of the European Union. And, and, and this, of course, uh, un undermines uh, the, the positive rhetoric. This undermines um, all the resources, uh, all the funds that Turkey uh, has devoted uh, to the Syrian refugees. So there seems to be a stark tension between this very callous, instrumental rhetoric Erdogan uses and the, the embracing, the, the benevolent uh, rhetoric he uses. And John Torres at Lagrange College. Uh, President Erdogan did visit Washington last month. He met with President Trump. Uh, but I think probably the the news headlines that dominated that visit was this video of President Erdogan's bodyguards apparently attacking some protesters outside the Turkish embassy in Washington. Tell us what the takeaway from that incident and that visit has been. Well, I think that gave uh, Americans a spoiler alert to how things are going on in Turkey. Uh, it seems like the security forces were chatting with Erdogan before they uh, launched these attacks. These are peaceful protesters. And I was pleased to see the U.S. House of Representatives uh, condemned uh, the Turkish security forces for attacking these protesters. And what do we know about Erdogan's relationship with President Trump? Has that been f warm and friendly or has it been characterized by some tension? It's uh, been considered pretty rocky. I think that when Trump was initially elected, they thought, okay, this is someone who we can do business with and even you know, kowtow a little bit to Turkish needs because there's, uh, Trump has some business dealings in Turkey. And Trump has not done that. And I think that that has made Erdogan bristle a lot. And so that's, uh, that's why we see this deterioration of relationships. And Nick Ashdown, if I could ask you about one other event that's happened recently, uh, just in the past 24 hours, Turkey has authorized uh, sending troops to Qatar to support that country in its dispute with Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern nations. It seems like a significant escalation in the tension in the Middle East between Saudi Arabia, Egypt on the one side, Qatar and now Turkey on the other. What's, what's, what's behind that move? Well, I mean, it's still very early to to make like really sort of in depth analysis, but um, Turkey Qatari relations uh, have been getting closer and closer. They entered a new phase um, with a, a military and defense agreement in March of 2014. Uh, uh, there's going to be a Turkish base in Qatar. They're sending troops soon, um, and there's a lot of business dealings between the two countries. Um, they, there's a lot of shared concerns um, with certain conflicts in the Middle East and various countries in the Middle East. Um, and, and Turkey's really trying to sort of flex its muscles as a, as a sort of middle power. Um, and so it's expressed uh, support for Qatar during, uh, during this sort of crisis where um, uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, and Yemen uh, have, um, have cut off ties with them, but uh, it is sort of yet to be seen um, what the conclusion will be. But Turkey has also been very careful not to criticize uh, the countries the, um, that have cut off relations with Qatar. Well, Ikan Erdemir, the U.S. and Europe do have a number of different interests in Turkey. There is this enormous refugee issue. Um, there are relations with Russia. There's the war in Syria. How have these affected the international response to this great purge that's basically taken place over the past year. Has that sort of hindered the U.S. or Europe from speaking out sort of effectively on this, or have they been outspoken nonetheless? 
Indeed, Turkey has a great real estate value. It uh, hosts Injilic Air Base, which is key to operations in the Middle East. And uh, so both for the European Union and for the US, uh, we have seen that human rights issues have often been on the back burner, uh, meaning often uh, strategic issues trumped uh, rights and freedoms issues. This doesn't mean that uh, there are occasional criticisms uh, from the European Parliament. Uh, we've, we see criticism in uh, the progress reports. Uh, we sometimes see criticism from US State Department. But in, in general, there seems to be a, a, a very a, a strategy of delicate balancing, both on the EU uh, and the US side. However, with the recent escalation, uh, we might see a new trend. For example, recently, uh, Germany announced that uh, given um, th th these vast disagreements uh, over, the, over policy issues, uh, German military is going to relocate uh, its forces from Injerlik Air Base, possibly to Jordan. Uh, there are, there are uh, various reports and discussions uh, in the U.S. capital uh, about whether U.S. Uh, should also start redeploying some of its forces from Injirlik, which, which shows that uh, when it comes to the EU and U.S. side, uh, there are other options, that uh, they, they will not be blackmailed uh, to the fullest extent, and they might uh, bring back uh, some of these key issues of democracy, human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, minority rights, religious freedoms uh, to the table in their bilateral relations with Turkey. And John Torres, we got uh, Ikan Erdemir ends on sort of a hopeful note there about the nature of U.S.-European Union relationships with Turkey. What about inside Turkey? You know, a lot of what we've discussed so far is quite sort of depressing, pessimistic. Is there reason for some hope that that issues like democracy and human rights will improve over the next five years? When I was over there, it was in June of 2015, and there were a lot of Turks who were very committed to democracy and human rights. They tend to be the younger people. Uh, I think uh, Erdogan gets a lot of his support from the older guard. They see themselves as their entire uh, economic situation is dependent on Erdogan being in power. The younger generation is the one who are more skeptical of him. So it's hopeful that if somehow Erdogan left office or so, the future would be very bright if these people can hold on. And Nick Ashton, with just about 30 seconds left, I'll give you the last word. Uh, well, yeah, this is the question I always ask everyone I interview. Uh, are there reasons for hope left? And I really struggle to find them because the, the sort of traditional reasons for hope, um, robust civil society, I, I, mean, I mean like comparatively for the region, robust civil society, good universities, a large increasingly globalized middle class, um, etc., these things are being systematically destroyed one uh, one piece at a time, particularly civil society and education. And a lot of uh, the sort of cream of the crop, the the sort of globalized uh, middle classes are, are leaving or thinking about leaving. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Diego Cupolo, Icon Erdemir, Nick Ashdown, and John Torres for joining us. Global Journalist is directed by Travis McMillan. Pat Akers is audio engineer. Rachel Foster Gimbel is studio producer. And this week's show producers are Idam Kasaye and Jin Hong Chen. We bid farewell this week to Jin Hong, an extraordinarily talented young journalist who's leaving us soon to join Chicago, Chicago Public Radio's Worldview. We wish her all the best. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.